Today's lecture, of course, I'll be getting into discussing mostly like the kind of the central high part uh, of the Middle Ages. Uh, mostly going to talk about two things today, <clears throat> the Viking Age. I'll kind of spend a lot of time on that uh, today. And then I will get into the Crusades, uh, kind of a very famous event. Probably one of the most famous events may have happened in the Middle Ages, I would say, uh, was the Crusades happened around the high middle ages <clears throat> and uh, so i'll get into that so if you have any comments questions during uh, the lecture you know let me know on the live stream or you can always leave me a comment question later on my channel uh, or you can email me if you got a question about the class or whatever uh, more or less uh, here's the link to streamyard.com if you want to also join me uh, in the broadcast booth uh, also as well so uh from last time uh lecture wise uh, i think we had been talking about uh, the early Middle Ages. I kind of went into and discussed the Byzantine or Eastern Roman Empire. Uh, we talked about the rise of Islam. Uh, and then I think the last thing I did was I talked about um, how in medieval Europe, uh, they had the rise of the Franks. Uh, we had the Merovingian, Carolingian, you know, dynasties uh, that ruled Western Europe, you know, like France, Germany, Italy, uh, et cetera. And I talked about how it peaked under uh, Emperor Charlemagne, who kind of unified the West. Well, again, all that well, from before, <clears throat> but all that starts to kind of come to an end, of course, uh, because of the Viking Age. We're going to, of course, talk about that today, which is a, a big thing that, of course, uh, occurs that's <clears throat> kind of important um, overall. And, um, yeah, so-called Viking Age, well, which you can see there. Of course, there's that Osberg longship they're talking about. Of course, that was found in the early 1900s. Of course, uh, yeah, the outbreak of the Viking Age is something that you start seeing, you know, uh, at that time, which kind of starts around about the 8th, 9th centuries is about when, when I guess, the Viking Age kind of gets started uh, at that point. And um, they think it, uh, it's something that started around 8th, 9th century uh, when you have the Scandinavian peoples uh, that begin to leave. And they, they start settling in parts of Europe. Uh, they really invade. A lot of them do, of course. It's kind of an extension of the migration period that went back to like the third, fourth centuries uh, in Europe when you have all these Germanic peoples that invade because uh, the Vikings were kind of somewhat related to the Germanic peoples. At least their culture was kind of influenced by them uh, more than anything. And um, they are later nicknamed the Norse, the Norse, Norsemen, quite common, or also Northmen, like Northmen, I think, or Norman, it's often used because uh, they came out of Northern Europe, uh, sailing from like mostly those areas, Denmark, uh, Norway, Sweden, that's your area, what they call Scandinavia today. Uh, you can throw Finland in there too, which is kind of east of um, Sweden as well. Uh, but, but they also settled, you know, all kinds of areas you can see, like Britain, like parts of Britain, like Eng Eastern England, uh, northern Scotland, uh, parts of Ireland, uh, northern France, Iceland, Greenland, uh, the northern part of the Germany, like around the Baltic coast. Uh, southern Italy, believe it or not, in Sicily, you had Vikings that settled there. And then Russia and the Ukraine were other areas that they went into uh, also as well. Looks like Devin is joining us this morning. Hey, what's going on uh, also uh, as well. So yeah, the Vikings, Vikings start to come into uh, Europe. And you can see, by the way, um, kind of a map of the areas that they will kind of invade uh, into uh, different parts of Europe and the North Atlantic uh, right here. And um, so yeah, you can see all those areas that they kind of so starting, I guess, as early as the 8th eighth, eighth century, you start seeing some Vikings uh, that come in. Uh, supposedly the first area they attacked uh, it was an area called, uh, I don't know if you can see it on the map here, it's kind of hard to see, somewhere like up in the uh, northern part of England, around where Lindisfarne Island is, uh, it's where they attacked, I think around 793 uh, CE or AD, uh, and so that's the first that the, really that the Europeans, like in the rest of Christian Europe, you know, start to see uh, some of these uh, pagan type cultures that start to come in uh, from northern Europe. Uh, oh, the term Viking, by the way, is a derogatory term. Uh, it's kind of a term meaning like they were like pirates or bandits. I think it comes from a saying which is um, to go a Viking, which means to go like raiding 
just something they're kind of, you know, famous for, uh, the Vikings. Uh, but that's kind of like this stereotype that people kind of saw the Vikings as, as these pirates that would attack people, you know, pillage, rape, and burn, you know, and all that. Uh, but um, the Vikings weren't just that. They were really a culture that was relied a lot on farming. Uh, they were great sailors, uh, like like the long ship that we, sh of course, showed a little short video, uh, were like almost like works of art, you know, the way they were constructed, uh, you know, using wood. Uh, so, yeah, um, it's that, that's the stereotype, you know, you see like in movies and TV shows and, you know, in Hollywood they have, you know, Vikings with horns on their helmets, but traditionally I don't know if they ever had horns on their helmets. It's something that kind of Hollywood kind of, kind of invented and all that, uh, more or less. <clears throat> uh, looks like Jessica's joining us also this morning. Hey, what's going on uh, also uh, as well? Um, yeah, of course, that's that's something that uh, I'll kind of talk about, of course, today. The, the so-called, you know, like I said, the long ship that they're kind of known for, uh, for sailing with, which is right here, the so-called Osbar Osberg long ship. Of course, we're talking about, you know, originally from that little short video they went into uh, from uh, the Smith Smithsonian Channel. Uh, and, um, yeah, uh, the Viking long ship, they were these shadow drafted wooden ships. Uh, they were very versatile. They could go pretty much anywhere. Uh, and so they could sail these ships pretty much like up rivers. They could beach them, you know, and all that. Uh, they could go through like lakes and seas, oceans. Believe it or not, they crossed like the Atlantic Ocean in these ships, which is pretty amazing. Uh, they also used them um, as funerary ships uh, when they would like bury somebody like a chieftain or somebody powerful. Uh, they would bury them in their ship, and they think that's what the Osberg ship is. It's like a burial-type ship that they discovered uh, in Norway in the early 1900s. And it's, like I said, one of the most preserved ships that they've ever found that they've kind of restored uh, more or less. And uh, you can see here that they sailed them all over the place. They went, like, across the Atlantic, Mediterranean Sea, Black Sea, Caspian Sea, Baltic Sea, so all those different seas. Uh, they sailed up into uh, at one point, which is uh, pretty amazing. I think they discovered part of North America. I think some people think they may have even explored part of Africa. I think there were theories about that too, maybe. Uh, but um, but yeah, th their culture was, you know, like I said, very versatile. You know, going all over the world. Hey, Gavin, what's going on? Also this morning uh, as well. So yeah, Viking ship. Um, and oh, and uh, I told you in Britain they called them dragon ships because. Uh, they would sometimes put dragon heads and monsters on the front of the ship to kind of scare people and things like that. And that's something they're kind of known for uh, also as well. But they were very, very fast and swift, uh, ore powered uh, pretty much. Uh, here's kind of a typical what a Viking ship uh, usually looked like. So like with oars and uh, sails being used uh, also as well. So some of the fastest ships up until maybe modern times uh, that were built. Well, more or less. <clears throat> so it's kind of like our galley ships that you see like, like in Italy later. Now, um, also another thing about the Vikings, uh, they believed in a lot of uh, pagan-like gods, which of course is true uh, about the Vikings. Uh, a lot of the Viking like religion uh, was heavily influenced uh, by uh, the Germanic peoples. Uh, and um, I think I've caught Old Norse, I guess, is, you know, kind of the term they sometimes use, or uh, Norse mythology or Norse religion uh, is a term they kind of use. And um, usually uh, a lot of their gods were kind of warlike, uh, especially like Odin. You see in that image, which is probably an idol that they worship uh, more or less. And so with pagan mythology, with the Norse, uh, they had all these different gods they had. They, they may have like a lot of gods. I think I counted a while back, but they may have like maybe 50 or more gods that they believed in. Uh, some of these gods were heavily influenced from German ideas, like northern German tribes in northern Europe. Maybe some Roman influence, too, uh, that are also that go into it uh, also as well. The, those are some of the most famous gods, of course, you see there. Odin, of course. Uh, sometimes called Woden, of course, um, is their chief god, god of the warriors uh, who resided uh, at Valhalla, 
We know about that. Uh, his wife is Frigg, uh, of course, seen as a mother goddess uh, to the Vikings. Uh, he had two sons, Thor and Balder. Thor, of course, more of a god of like the god of thunder and lightning, uh, who often was famous for brandishing a hammer. You know, probably know that. Uh, of course, Thor is probably one of the most famous gods you know today because of He's a lot in a lot of movies and TV shows and uh, things like that now, like in Hollywood. Uh, Balder is the god of like bravery, beauty uh, as well. And then, yeah, Frey and Freya were like these twin gods. Uh, they were kind of famous. Uh, Frey was like a fertility god. And then Freya was a sister uh, who was like this fertility god uh, that was also associated with like love and I think war. Uh, just kind of like a cross between Aphrodite and Athena. Uh, and then Loki, uh, often called the trickster god, uh, was a god associated with like luck, fortune, mischief, uh, and things like that. So uh, those are different gods that they're kind of known for. Uh, but uh, over time, you know, I think up to like, I want to say eighth, up to like maybe the 10th century or so, they're pretty much like pagan. And then 10th, 11th century, you start seeing the Vikings starting to convert over to Christianity, uh, which takes a while. But I think by the 11th, 12th century, Scandinavia eventually converts over to Christianity. Uh, but yeah, like I said, Odin reigned from Valhalla, which Valhalla is actually this great hall. I think they call it the Hall of Slain, I believe it is. Uh, and he reigned at what is called Asgard. And so Asgard, I think, is actually, I think, what they call Viking heaven, uh, where all the gods reside and uh, stuff like that. Uh, this, I don't think you have to know about this, but I don't know if you know, but like the days of the week, some of them are actually named after the Viking gods. Like Wednesday's named after Thor, excuse me, excuse me, Odin, named after Odin. Uh, Thursday's named after Thor. Uh, and then Fr Friday's named after Frey. So Wednesday's Woden Day or Odin's Day, I guess. Uh, Thursday's Thor's Day. And then Friday is Frey's Day. Uh, if you get that right there. So thank God it's Frey Day. Huh? <laughs> that kind of thing. So, but anyway, uh, kind of kind of talking about the Viking culture uh, in. Um, Another thing about the Vikings, uh, they were also uh, seen as, um, here's an image of Thor, by the way. The Vikings were also seen uh, as this culture that was known for exploring a lot. You know, they were really the first major explorers you know, throughout the world uh, at the time, exploring like parts of Europe, uh, exploring parts of the North Atlantic uh, you know, with their ships and all that. Uh, and so the Vikings will start settling all throughout different parts of Europe. I think I've got a map showing you uh, how areas that they, they kind of explore and settle uh, throughout parts of Europe. It's kind of barred from Wikipedia or whatever, but um, you can see here uh, kind of the direction that they go on. So you can see they start in obviously in Scandinavia and they work their way uh, kind of westward and eastward uh, like into like the British Isles first here and move up through Iceland and Greenland. And you can see here they went eastward also like toward the Caspian and Black Seas. Uh, also, you can see they, they went down like where Spain is, uh, also into like Southern Europe, like Italy. Uh, so they're obviously all over the place, uh, the Vikings. Uh, everywhere you see in green are kind of areas that they raided at one point, but you can see also areas where they settled at one point uh, throughout different parts of, you know, of, of Europe and, and the North Atlantic, as the main areas they kind of went into uh, more or less. I'll give you examples of areas they settled, like uh, in England, like especially the eastern part of England. Uh, they settled in an area called Danelaw, which the Danes or, you know, Vikings from Denmark uh, settled there, which uh, you can kind of see in this map. It's an area that's kind of in this red area right here. They call it area the so-called Danelaw because they were under their own laws, their own Viking laws, Dane laws, I guess. Uh, and it's like the time of um, Alfred the Great, like around the ninth century. Uh, they're having the English are having to fight them, you know. Uh, but for a while, the actual Vikings, like the Danes, took over England, and they had like three or four kings that actually ruled. King Swin, you can see Canute, Harold the First, and Hartha Canute as well. I think Harold the First and Hartha Canute were or sons of King Canute. I think Canute might be one of the most famous. It's also spelled C-A-N-U-T-E, Canute, uh, as well. So you have some of these Vikings that took over and became kings uh, in parts of Europe. But I think most of them were, were reigning, uh, like in, say, like in Denmark and all that. 
Uh, they also sell like an iron. Like if you had an iron, you got people with red hair and all that. And so, yeah, that's why that's the truth about that. And uh, Vikings often had more fair skin, uh, blonde, red hair, and things like that. You see like in Northern Europe, uh, more or less. Uh, and then from there, you can see they also settled Northern Scotland way up there. And then also you can see from there, they went into Iceland uh, as well and settled uh, there, which they start selling Iceland around the 9th, 10th centuries and then finally, they go into also Greenland. Uh, there's a Viking named Eric uh, the Red, you may have heard of, uh, who would discover, you know, Greenland. Uh, who He's the one that coined it. He called it Greenland because he was trying to get people to go there. Because Greenland is really, a, if you know about it, it's a, freak, it's, a gla it's a glacier, you know, basically. Uh, so uh, he was trying to get people to settle there. I think Greenland's actually colder than Iceland because you know, it's further north. Uh, but it haven't only got people to go there and settle, and so they created a Viking settlement there, you know, and all that for a while anyway. Uh, then they got Leif Erikson. He's another famous Viking that's well known. Leif um, also was known for uh, exploring part of, um, they think, the North Atlantic, uh, discovering uh, what would be, uh, he, he's the one who discovers part of North American Canada, like they think Eastern Canada, uh, and it's believed that the Vikings uh, settled uh, in what is, uh, they think, uh, the maybe the northern tip of um, what is, um, they got the so-called Vinland map here, which kind of shows you maybe where they think it was. It's kind of a debate about where it was, more or less. The Vinland map was a famous map they found in modern times, which they, did, they, they think depicts where they think um, the Vikings settled, which is right here. But some people think it was uh, Newfoundland. Uh, some people think it's Nova Scotia, possibly, of where it is. Uh, Erickson was also called, uh, they called him Leaf the Lucky, because he was kind of lucky in finding things as an explorer. Uh, but the Vikings actually would settle, they think, Newfoundland for sure, because they do found, like, archaeological sites like Leon's All, All Meadows, which that's that's still, still on the northern tip there, well, they think, think was created about circa maybe 1,000. Uh, more or less. So I think they called it Vinland. Yeah, Vinland. That's the name. Vinland or Vineland is, I think, usually the common name that the Vikings called, you know, that, that particular land because they found like wild grapes growing there, which were brought back to Iceland. Uh, and so there's a bunch of like uh, these Viking epic poems, like the Icelandic epics and other epics that were written uh, about, about, you know, Viking exploration and all that. And, um, but they think what happened was the Vikings later uh, would abandon, they abandoned Canada or, or North America because of, of like basically Native American cultures that were kind of, you know, taking over that region. Uh, they think they called them Screelings was the original name uh, of the so-called, um, they call them Thule people, Thule, T-H-U-L-E, or people say also uh, the Inuit, uh, you know, like the people live with igloos later and all that in, in, in Canada and Alaska, uh, but um, they abandoned it within like a generation or so. And so the Vikings, you know, never came back uh, and all that. So one thing they do think about the Vikings more or less, they think the Vikings were the first Europeans to really discover, you know, America. Uh, they were the first to do that, you know, around 1000 CE. Uh, but you don't really have anybody else come back until the time of Columbus, uh, in the late 15th century, about 500 years later. Uh, so that's something they do give credit for the, you know, for the Vikings being the first Europeans uh, to do that. But obviously the the Native American peoples that were already there have been there for thousands of years already, you know, before they actually discovered it and was kind of lost for, you know, a long time, more or less. Hey, Mark Hello, hope you're having a great morning out there uh, also as well. So we're kind of talking about, you know, Vin the Vinland map and and all that, and, and what they think was Vinland in North America. Uh, going back up to this map right here, also you can see in the map that you had Vikings that came into, um, you look here, there's some that came out of like um, Norway, Sweden, I guess, and settled um, in Normandy, uh, right here uh, in what is northern France. Uh, and um, you have, um, they call them Normans. Uh, you know, I think they came out of Norway, I guess, since the name or whatever. They would settle there in northern France, which was called Normandy uh, afterwards. And they had this chieftain they had that led them named Rollo, who was kind of famous. Uh, I think he lived, I want to say, around the 9th, 10th century. 
And he formed this alliance with France, like the early kingdom of France, which was kind of developing at that time. Uh, and um, what happened was the um, Normans that took over um, Normandy, like in northern France, became like this duchy or, you know, the duchy of Normandy, I think they call it later, which is later part of the kingdom of France originally. And so all the rulers afterwards were called the Duke, Dukes of Normandy, uh, basically, that you have. So it's kind of weird, too, because like the Normans become this culture that is kind of a mix of like Viking, uh, Frankish culture or, or French culture uh, that becomes Catholic. They, they convert to Roman Catholicism and they, I guess they intermarry with the, the women there uh, and all of that. And um, later on, the Normans will later, if you know about this, they invade parts of Europe. They take over uh, southern Italy. Uh, they take over Sicily. They also take over England. They actually kind of spread out you know, throughout Europe. And uh, the most famous was the um, takeover of England, the so-called Norman conquest that happened in 1066 when one of their, you know, one of their descendants, you know, uh, William the Duke of Normandy, who was later called William the Conqueror, as they call him in England, uh, would come over and conquer England uh, and defeat the Anglo-Saxons that still ruled over parts of England. And he's, of course, uh, if you know about um, William, later called William the I, uh, he was known for uh, the Battle of Hastings in October of 1066, where he defeated the last Anglo-Saxon king you see there, Harold Hardrada. Uh, and so from there, the, the so-called Norman dynasty took over. So the Normans took over like England, they ruled northern France and other parts of France uh, after that. Uh, and so they think the Normans are kind of instrumental because they helped to kind of spread like the ideals of like feudalism, like in France and in England. And uh, I think, I think William the first William the conqueror was also known for the, the Domesday book. You may have heard of that he uh, issued on 1086, which is a great survey of England, surveying all the lands that King William owned, you know, after he conquered England uh, and all that. So like we have Daphne joined us also. So I hope you're having a great morning. Uh, also out there uh, as well. Uh, also in the map here, you can see, uh, if you go to the eastern part of it, like in this area here, you got another, also Vikings from like maybe Sweden, uh, that kind of spread out eastward into Russia uh, in, in the Ukraine. So they, they got that too as well uh, that occurs. Uh, and so the Vikings settled there because they were trying to, to start trade with like Asia, uh, the Byzantine Empire, uh, which was like, you know, around Turkey and the Black Sea. Uh, so, so yeah, that was part of why they went into those areas. So, like in the video, they talked how they, they used the Viking ship uh, to get down into Russia, like the Don, uh, the Volga River, the Dnieper, uh, things like that. Uh, the Slavs called them the Rus, but I think their original name, they are called Varangians, was the common name. Uh, they called the Vikings. It's like some like Star Trek nickname there. But, um Anyway, um, they call them Rus because uh, the term Rus was a, a Slavic nickname uh, for the fact that the Vikings would row their ships, you know, the long ships. So I think Rus meant to row, like the rowers, I guess they called them, basically. So Russia basically meant the land of the Rus, but it meant the land of the, the rowers because of the Vikings that came in. Uh, so the Vikings take that gets established there is kind of a combination of a mix of Slavic and Viking peoples. That's kind of what creates the so-called, they call it the Kievan Rus uh, state that, that kind of forms afterwards or states uh, that are there, uh, which are based around the Ukraine mostly uh, in uh, what is like where Kiev is today. Kiev is the capital of Ukraine. And for a long time, that was the central city or capital of like this early Russian state uh, that formed there. Later, Moscow will be more important to the Middle Ages, but not now. Uh, and uh, they had all these different um, rulers that came in. They weren't called kings. The early rulers of Russia were not like czars or kings. Uh, they were called either a grand prince or a grand duke. I think the first ruler was like the grand prince of Kiev. Those are some of their early rulers on the bottom. Uh, the Rurik, I think they say, was one of the first famous ones uh, that reigned, uh, like around the close to the 9th century, 9th, 10th century, uh, and uh, Rurik and Oleg, uh, those two were, I think, were uh, famous, early famous rulers. 
uh, which a lot of them are descended from Vikings. Uh, and then uh, more into the late 9th, early 10th century, uh, you've got Vladimir uh, the first, known as the Great. Uh, he's really considered the first great uh, ruler uh, that they had of uh, the Viking culture. Uh, and um, he was known for um, converting all of the Russians to Christianity. Uh, if you know about it, the um, the, the, the Russian culture, you know, in like the Ukraine uh, was heavily influenced by the Byzantine Empire. Uh, which had you know, Orthodox Christianity, uh, and so they decided to convert everybody to that religion. And so they think Vladimir, close to maybe 1,000, uh, began to convert everybody. And so that's why in Russia, that's the main religion later that they have, like with the Russian Empire, et cetera, up to modern times uh, now. So he's like really one of their first great rulers. I think he died about 116, 1,016, uh, about five years ago. And I know, it's a, I know he's like considered like a saint. I know, I think, in the uh, Eastern Orthodox Church in Russia and all that today. But yeah, they had a dynasty. It was called the Rurik Dynasty, which they think was named after Rurik. And so uh, later when you have the czars, uh, like I think Ivan the Third, Ivan the Fourth, like Ivan the Terrible, all that later uh, in more into early modern Russia, uh, those are kind of descended back to supposedly, you know, that particular dynasty and all that. Uh, but you can see besides religion, like language, like the Russian language, Cyrillic, uh, was something that evolved from, uh, they think, uh, from Greek, from the Byzantine Empire. Uh, they think that uh, it was named after this guy named Cyril, I think it was. He was some kind of Byzantine Christian monk that came to Russia and helped, helped them develop their language and all that. A lot of your architecture in Russia was influenced by the Byzantine Empire, uh, like St. Basil's Cathedral, you know, in Moscow is an example, like with its onion domes and all that, uh, are highly influenced by Byzantine culture and all that. That's why all the czars are called czars, because, you know, it's named after the term Caesar, which I guess they still used in the Byzantine Empire uh, as well. Later, Russia sees, you know, Moscow as the third Rome, you know, because, you know, Rome, uh, Constantinople, and then Moscow, uh, you know, but that's more like into, I guess, modern times later. So kind of talking about the Vikings, how the Viking culture kind of just spread, you know, throughout Europe and all that. Uh, why did the Vikings decline? Uh, well, they converted to Christianity. Uh, they began to settle down uh, throughout Europe. Uh, the rise of feudalism, I think, more or less in Europe also probably contributed to why, why they declined. But pretty much their culture kind of merged with other European cultures. Uh, they became Christian, had a lot to do with it, uh, more or less. So people in Europe, you know, a lot of them are, are still descended from some Vikings. You know, they kind of settled there, not just in Scandinavia, but other parts of you know, Europe as well. All right, um, let me go ahead and move on next. We're going to, of course, talk a lot today uh, also about the Crusades. That's, that's of course, the other big topic, you know, which uh, the Crusades uh, was a major event uh, that occurred uh, during the during the High Middle Ages, in fact, the most famous event that really occurs, the High Middle Ages kind of peaks around, I guess, about the 11th, 13th centuries is about about when it is. Uh, and uh, you can see here that the uh, Crusades were a series of wars, which they were uh, fought between Christians and Muslims, uh, especially the Catholic West, like Catholic Europe uh, in general, uh, was on one side, of course, fighting uh, in the wars uh, and they fought to control Jerusalem. A lot of the Christians in the West wanted to take back the Holy Land, like where Israel is. And a lot of the lands that were kind of around, like from Turkey all the way down to Israel, Turkey, probably Syria, Lebanon, Israel, all those areas, which, uh, by the way, had been part of the uh, Byzantine Empire, which had, I guess been controlled by Christians a long time ago. Uh, they wanted to get back all this land. Uh, so that was pretty much their intentions. Uh, of it. And they do think that part of why it happened was because the Byzantine Empire was declining uh, in, in the East. It was. And they asked for help. Well, literally, they, they came to, uh, they wanted basically, you know, they wanted support, you know, from them uh, to fight the uh, Seljuk Turks, the Turks who had come into uh, the Middle East, like they took over Turkey and all that. Turks were more warlike because they were Caucasian peoples. Uh, and um, so they, they were kind of 
created a lot of conflict between Christians and Muslims, uh, which kind of brought on the war, wars between them, which would go on for multiple centuries up to like the 13th. And I think even some of the Crusades went up to the 14th century, believe it or not. Because uh, there was 10 or more Crusades at one point uh, that were fought. Uh, they think how the Crusades kind of got started uh, was they had this ruler in the Byzantine Empire named Alexius I or Alexius Comnenus, uh, who evidently needed military aid because uh, a lot of his empire was being shrunk. Uh, if you go back to, I think, 1071, I believe it was, Battle of Manzikert, uh, the Turks, some of the Seljuk Turks, had taken over Turkey. And so that brought on the Crusades, you know, afterwards. And so the Catholic Church, they asked the Catholic Church for help in the West, like in Rome. And so one of the popes at the time, his name was Pope Urban II, decided to intervene. And he started giving sermons, you know, about helping, you know, the, the Christians and the Christian brothers uh, in the East. I think it was in 1095 when this happened. And he also said, Urban II also said that if any crusader went and fought in the East, you know, in the Crusades, uh, that all their sins would be forgiven, no matter what they did. They killed somebody or whatever, uh, they, they would be forgiven uh, totally for it. Uh, they think that's where the indulgences thing came from, but you know about that was big in the Reformation, uh, was because of the Crusades. It was kind of like an indulgence, really. Um, so, yeah, that brought on all the Crusades uh, that followed afterwards, which there were there were numerous crusades that happened. Like I said, there were like up to like probably about 10 of them uh, at one that, that were fought. Of course, here's like a kind of a picture here, of course, of the first three that were probably, probably the first two or three were the kind of the most famous ones that they had uh, literally that occurred uh, in, in the early uh, crusades. Uh, the first crusade uh, was the most successful uh, of all the crusades, probably because they didn't know they were coming, I guess, uh, the Turks and also the fact that they think they put up the more most forces uh, the Christians in the in the West did, uh, which there may have been as many as a hundred thousand people that may have gotten involved in the First Crusade at one point uh, that were combatants and non-combatants uh, that actually fought uh, in in the First Crusade uh, and all that. And the First Crusade was actually two crusades; it wasn't one. It was actually this one crusade called the People's Crusade, uh, which started out around 1096. Uh, and it was led by this uh, preacher named Peter the Hermit. Uh, they marched across Europe, uh, and uh, it was famous for different things. Uh, I don't know if you know much about it, but they were kind of like as they marched across Europe. I've got on a map right here showing you. Uh, they massacred anybody that wasn't considered like Catholic. Like if you were like a Jew or something like that, they basically killed you. <laughs> they massacred a lot of Jews as they went eastward. Not horrible. Muslims, too, uh, as well. And so you can see they marched towards Constantinople uh, right there. And then uh, this particular crusade, the, the, at least the People's Crusade, like that one, that one got wiped out. It never made it. You know, they all got killed uh, right there. Uh, and, um, you know, they got wiped out. Uh, but they had another crusade called the Princess Crusade uh, that followed that was more successful, uh, that one. Uh, and uh, with that one, um, they think they were more successful. In it. But it took them a while, but by July of 1099, uh, they retook the city of Jerusalem. Uh, but you can see there they also retook parts of, like, Turkey. Uh, they retook Syria, Lebanon, and most of Israel uh, was also retaken as well. So pretty much this area here, Turkey, like from Odessa down through Antioch, Tripoli, Accra, Jerusalem, all these areas were areas that they re-seized uh, in the First Crusade. So that's why I talk about that one being you know, the most important one, I guess, they had uh, overall uh, because of the fact that they were so successful you know, with it. Now, following the First Crusade, one of the things that happened that's well known was they created a lot of these um, so-called crusader states uh, afterwards. Uh, to kind of uh, settle those areas that they took, you know, from the Turks at that point. Uh, and uh, these were um, mostly Christian states or kingdoms uh, or principalities, whatever you want to call them, that the uh, Crusaders called them outremer states, which outremer means uh, it was a kind of a Latin term that meant um, overseas uh, states. And they became like these Catholic realms, uh, basically, that were ruled either by monarchs or nobility, 
Uh, and there were four of them that were there, of course. You can see the map. Uh, they were basically, I'll give them on the screen here, but they were basically the county of Edessa was first, the principality of Antioch was another one, county of Tripoli, and the kingdom of Jerusalem. So you can see all the dates that they were around uh, at one point, um, which you can see the kingdom of Jerusalem was the one that was the longest ar around. It was up to like the late 13th century. It existed at one point. And uh, it was the only one that had a king. All the other ones had pretty much either a count or a prince that reigned over them. Uh, so you can see in the map here, that'll look right here. Uh, the county of Edessa was primarily like where part of Syria is today, southern Turkey. Uh, one of Antioch uh, was in mostly like Syria, Lebanon. County of Tripoli was in kind of like southern Lebanon. And the kingdom of Israel was in basically in um, most of Israel, part of like Jordan today. So those are all the areas uh, they existed uh, at one point. And over time, it's going gonna, it's gonna to shrink. Well, you'll see that's like the biggest, I think, right now uh, at that point. But over time, it'll eventually shrink. Uh, also, if you go to the map here, there was one called the Principality of Armenia, Cilicia. I don't think you really got to know about that one. But that was another uh, Christian state they formed also, which was done by the Armenians. Armenians were... Uh, Christians that were in like eastern Turkey and also around where the kind of, like of Georgia and the Caucasus region is between the Caspian and Black Sea. They had had a kingdom there, the kingdom of Armenia, uh, but it was destroyed by the Turks. And so they fled west and they were able to create a state there because uh, they're Christian, all of that. And so that's what that was there. And it was actually a state there for a while up to like the Crusader period uh, as well. But oh, over time, it it, it gets... Most all those areas get wiped out eventually by the uh, by the Turks and all that later. Now another thing I did want to mention, which is true uh, about the Crusades. After the Crusades uh, ended, uh, you had this other deal uh, where uh, they had um, various um, military orders that were created uh, because of the Crusades. Because you know most of the Crusaders went back home after the first conflict. Well, there was like very few of them left afterwards, and some were left behind to kind of guard over the Holy Land, uh, protect any unarmed pilgrims that wanted to visit or merchants that wanted to come to, to that rate to do trade in the region uh, and all that. And so they created all these different orders that were kind of famous, like you may have heard of. Here's some, of course, that were famous. The Knights Templar, the Templars, you know, was the most famous order that they had that was well known. Knights Hospitallers, also called the Knights of St. John. Order of St. James, which is more of a Spanish type, you know, uh, order that was famous. Order of Calatrava, which is also a Spanish order as well. And the Teutonic Knights was a German order that was also famous. So you get all these military orders that start kind of springing up everywhere, uh, not just in like the Middle East, but in Europe that also fight fighting a lot of wars uh, later. Uh, Knights Templar, you know, is a Catholic order. You see found in 1119. Uh, they did have their t uh, actual headquarters on the actual Temple Mount, where the old Temple of Jerusalem was uh, in Israel. Uh, and they think the headquarters was where the Dome of the Rock was, believe it or not. You know, they actually put it there uh, originally. They're famous for their Red Cross, which you see a lot on their uniforms, uh, like on their shields. Uh, so, yeah, I think they had a Red Cross. Teutonic Knights had a Black Cross. I think the Knights Hospital or Knights of St. John had a white cross. So different different uh, orders had different color crosses. I think the Knights of St. St. James had a in Spain had a red cross, uh, like the Templars also did uh, as well. Uh, but the Templars were like the shock troops of the Crusades, like especially in the Middle East. Uh, they were kind of this quasi-religious. They're almost like these monk warriors, basically, who had strange rituals. Well, like initiation rites, uh, they believe, but they were very wealthy. They owned a lot of land. Uh, they practically started the whole uh, Christian finance or banking system uh, throughout Europe, uh, and they controlled numerous fortifications throughout the Middle East and so on. Uh, so uh, they're, they're very, very powerful, you know, the Templars. Uh, and, um, of course, there's a lot of rumors about the Templars that they knew secrets about, like, the Holy Grail, uh, where the Ark of the Covenant was uh, at one point that are people still talking about today. 
Uh, some even think that the the Freemasons of today are kind of descended back to the Knights Templar and other types of uh, you know groups like that because uh, they were controlled by these grand masters that were kind of like master knights that were part of it. So that that's basically some of these orders of knights, but they're around throughout the high Middle Ages, but later on they get get stamped out and wiped out, uh, especially the Knights Templar. Right, I'm uh, moving on. I did want to talk about some of the other crusades uh, that they had. Uh, they had another crusade, uh, which uh, was the so-called Second Crusade, which that one was unsuccessful. Uh, it was fought because of the fact that the county of Edessa fell um, in the 1140s. It was conquered by the Turks. They got it back. And so it brought on these different rulers, uh, like the King of France, Louis VII, and the Holy Roman Emperor, King of Germany, Conrad III, sent forces uh, from Europe uh, to try to get it back, but they failed. They lost, of course, the Turks in 1149. I think the only positive thing they got out of it, if you knew about that, uh, Christians in the Second Crusade, was that some of the Christians that were going, sailing from England uh, to Europe landed in Portugal, they seized Lisbon from the Moors. And so Portugal became a Christian state uh, later uh, because of the Crusades, something kind of new I didn't know about. But um, so, yeah, that crusade didn't go well. Uh, then they had the third crusade. That one might be the second most famous one after the first crusade. Those two are pretty famous, uh, the first and third crusades, which that one occurred because of the uh Kurdish sultan and general named Saladin, or also called Salah ad-Din, uh, that became very powerful uh, during the uh, around the around the Third Crusade uh, at that point. And uh, Saladin was um, this um, he was actually of Kurdish origins. I think they say that Saladin is the most famous Kurd uh, in history. Uh, he's still kind of a hero to them. Kurds, a lot of them live in northern. Uh, Iraq, and probably around, I guess, part of Iran uh, as well. And uh, he's a founder of what they call the Ayyubid dynasty. The Ayyubid dynasty is a dynasty that reigned over basically Egypt and Syria during that time. Uh, and um, anyway, his armies were very powerful so much that eventually they would defeat the kingdom of uh, Jerusalem, like their main armies. And at the Battle of Hattin, someone's called the Horns of Hattin, by the way, uh, by Christians, uh, 1186, uh, he crushed their forces and then marched and laid siege to Jerusalem, and Jerusalem fell in 1187. Uh, so uh, that was kind of a major turning point, you know, uh, in the Crusades. And they think that the um, they think that the taking of uh, Jerusalem by Saladin uh, is what brought on the so-called Third Crusade, of course, that followed next. So that's that's what brought it on. Uh, at that point, and uh, the Third Crusade had a had a nickname. Uh, it was often called the King's Crusade. That's what people called it in Europe, uh, because of the fact that all these European kings decided to intervene uh, directly in in the conflicts with the Turks, uh, and so um, that's hence its name and all that. And so you got countries like France, uh, England, uh, the Holy Roman Empire uh, would send forces. Uh, but half of it was a failure uh, in the end. Uh, here's examples of some of the, the, the monarchs that were involved that were very famous uh, in the Third Crusade, why it's called the King's Crusade. But you got Richard I, you've heard of him called the Lionheart, probably the most famous one, uh, who was from England. Uh, he was, of course, um, one of the one of the um, sons of King John uh, the Second. Uh, him and him and um, was it King John? I think it was, or whatever it was, his name was. Um, but uh, oh no, King, no, no, one of the sons of King Henry II, excuse me, it was King John and King Richard were the son of King King yeah King uh, Henry II. But um, then you got Philip II, Augustus or Philip Augustus of France, the king there. Uh, Richard and uh, Philip II didn't like each other too much, but they put their differences aside to fight uh, in the Third Crusade. And Frederick Barbarossa, so it's called Frederick I of Germany, also kind of participated, but he died on the way there uh, in Turkey when he was crossing the river, he drowned, uh, basically. So he didn't like, really make it. But uh, they think that Richard uh, was really out of the different kings. Uh, he was really the most successful. 
uh, overall. Uh, he fought Salad into a draw pretty much, but uh, he was able to take control of a lot of the major cities uh, like in Israel, like Accra and Jaffa. And so, but he wasn't able to seize Jerusalem. That was the only thing about it, you know, with the Third Crusade. So, so I'm kind of viewed as a failure of uh, Third Crusade because uh, they weren't able to take everything back. Uh, but they did kind of seize a lot of the coastal area of, of Israel, Lebanon, uh, back from the Turks at that point. Uh, they did sue for peace. Like that's one thing that was kind of interesting about uh, the Crusaders uh, in Saladin, it was the first case of where they actually sued for peace in a treaty, uh, which kind of sometimes would happen in some of the Crusades. And so in 1192, there was a peace that was kind of decided where uh, what would happen was they decided that the Crusaders decided that the, that the Jerusalem would be in Muslim control. They would be able to keep it, uh, basically. But uh, the Turks would have to allow Christians to visit, you know, Israel, like the Holy Land and all that, and merchants could go there not be harmed and things like that. And so that was something that was decided uh, at that point. So you do have that kind of occur uh, at that point. But I guess the first first and third crusades, those are the ones that are the most famous. But they do get Jerusalem back, but it's not to like the sixth crusade, uh, but it's only briefly. Now, they had one more crusade, which was kind of controversial. Now, I've got kind of a picture. Oh, here's part of a picture, by the way, showing you uh, kind of the map of what I guess the Middle East looks like after the Third Crusade. So you can see all the land they have left uh, at that point. So you can see it's slowly shrinking. It's not the territory that they have in the eastern Mediterranean area uh, from Syria, Lebanon, all the way down to Israel. So it's kind of slowly, like half of it's almost gone uh, at that point. Uh, you can see, you can also see a lot of forts and castles that are built up and down the coast uh, also as well. Uh, to kind of defend these areas uh, from the Turks. And, of course, they have their own castles, too, uh, on the Islamic side uh, as well. Now, um, another thing, too, um, I'll mention as well, they have another crusade, which this one's kind of controversial that they have later, which is the so-called Fourth Crusade. Here's kind of a list of some of the later crusades. Uh, they have like at least nine or ten crusades at one point. They have, I'll kind of mention maybe the Children's Crusade that they have as well. Uh, that's well well known. Uh, and um, what happened was there was supposed to be a fourth crusade where what was going to occur was that the crusaders were going to attack and, re and recapture Jerusalem. Uh, they were supposed to attack, by the way, uh, through Egypt. They were going to invade through there and come up the I guess the southern coast through Israel. That was backed by the Catholic Church, which a lot of the early Crusades were. Uh, like Pope Innocent III, you can see, was the main pope that backed uh, the Fourth Crusade. And But what happened was uh, the Crusaders, um, for some reason, decided to attack uh, Constantinople. Now, there's different theories on why that happened. Uh, part of it was that a lot of the debts they owed uh, to... Uh, like in Italy, like the Venetians, or was one of the, uh, like Venice was one of the main states that was supporting a lot of the Crusaders, bearing them over and all that. Uh, it was also this deal where they wanted to support like a certain ruler on the throne, uh, but it kind of backfired. And uh, what they really wanted to do, a lot of the Crusaders, was they thought that they could loot it basically for riches because, you know, Constantinople was one of the most wealthy cities, you know, in that region. I think as they went into uh, like Turkish lands, they realized how poor they were. The Byzantine Empire had all the wealth. And so in 1204, they literally just attacked and looted it. Uh, and so, um, and what's crazy is they even tried to, the Crusaders even tried to put in their own uh, Catholic ruler on the throne of the Byzantine Empire, uh, which they did for like something like 50, 60 years uh, for a while. Uh, so, that's one thing that's interesting about the, the Crusaders. They, they really didn't trust the Byzantine Empire uh, because of the fact that they were not Catholic. They were like Orthodox Christians. And so that was kind of a kind of a thorn, you know, in the side of the whole Crusades because they didn't really trust each other because of the different religions. And the Catholics thought the Orthodox were kind of heretics because they believed the Catholic faith and vice versa uh, also as well. Uh, they do think that the Fourth Crusade 
uh, caused the East-West Schism, which is sometimes dubbed the Great Schism. And this was the split that happened between the Catholic and the Orthodox churches. Uh, part of why they fought the Crusades was to bring the two churches together. They thought they could bring these Christian brothers together, you know, and fight for one cause. And it actually did the opposite. It actually helped to kind of solidify, I think, the split, which had been kind of going on uh, throughout the Middle Ages. And so it was a combination of religious, ideological, political differences that really split the two churches, you know, over time. Uh, a lot of people confuse the Great Schism or East-West Schism with the Papal Schism, where, where the Catholic Church splits into two popes, one at Avignon in France and one at Italy and Rome. Uh, but that's later. That hadn't happened yet uh, when that occurs. That's more in the high late Middle Ages. Uh, and anyway, um, that's not the same thing, but it's basically, you know, that's kind of what happens with those two churches. And uh, those two communions are kind of like, they're still kind of split today. But I know there's been some dialogue that's been done uh, between the Catholic and the Orthodox churches where the popes met with some of their patriarchs and things like that. And so there's kind of, they try to smooth over differences between them, but there's still that I think since the Crusades, it's kind of still not good. All right. So uh, anyway, um, let me talk about some of the other Crusades. Yeah, you can see kind of a list of them. Uh, the Fifth Crusade was a crusade uh, where some Christians tried to invade through, through Egypt, like they were going to do in the Fourth Crusade. Uh, but it was actually uh, defeated by one of Saladin's nephews, nephew's name Al Kamil, uh, was I think his name was. Uh, that he had. Um, but um, the, the one that's the more famous one is the Sixth Crusade. That one was led by the uh, king of, of Germany, or the Holy Roman Emperor, which was Frederick II. Frederick II was the son of Frederick Barbarossa I. And uh, he led forces uh, from Germany uh, to Israel. But I think part of why he was able to retake Jerusalem was because of a treaty that was signed, believe it or not, uh, with the Turks. And uh, Saladin's nephew named Al Kamil, which the Crusaders, by the way, called Meladin, uh, and uh, it was caused by a civil war in the Ayyubid dynasty. Um, Saladin had like a lot of children. He had some of his brothers fighting over the throne and all that. And uh, anyway, because of the fact that Egypt was kind of like um, kind of in chaos, uh, Al Kamil just let Frederick just walk in and take it, uh, basically. And so that's how 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 Frederick was able to you know, seize control of Jerusalem, but they only held it for so many years up to about the 1240s. They lost it again later, but the Crusaders held like Accra, Jaffa, I think, until like the late 13th century, which were some of the last cities like around Israel that fell to the Turks later. Oh, they have later Crusades. These you don't have to know about, but you may have heard of St. Louis, uh, Louis the Ninth. Or you've been to like St. Uh, was it? St. Louis Cathedral, New Orleans, of course, it's there now. It's named for him. You know that. He was involved in a bunch of crusades, too. Seventh, Eighth Crusades uh, as well uh, in the 13th century. Uh, Edward I of England, the King of England, was involved in also the so-called Ninth Crusade. Uh, they had 13th century as well. Uh, those are all failures. None of them worked out, of course, uh, there. Um, and they have also this other crusade, which is kind of bizarre, that happened in 1222, called the Children's Crusade. Uh, that was one where a bunch of children got involved in a crusade, uh, I think in France and other countries like Germany, and they were going to march on the Middle East. And they thought that if the Turks saw these kids coming, that they would just give the, give the land up to them or whatever, but they never made it. Uh, I think a lot of them uh, went to ports like in France, and they got sold to slavery, uh, basically. So I think that's where the Pied Piper story kind of comes in, if you know about that and in Europe, that's kind of famous in medieval times. It's kind of linked to that. I think the Pied Piper may have been somehow involved in that, I know. But, um, but pretty much most of the Crusades uh, in the end were a total failure. Like none of them really worked out uh, in the end. Uh, back pretty much they think the Crusades, you know, helped to weaken Christianity in the East. Like the Eastern Orthodox faith uh, began to decline. It wasn't if you still got people that are Christian? That are there, they begin to become be, be more of a minority uh, because of Islam becomes the main religion, you know, throughout the Middle East. Uh, if you know that, 
Uh, and then the Byzantine Empire, you know, also would decline as well. It would weaken it even more uh, later. You know, they get conquered by the Ottoman Empire where Constantinople falls in 1453. So you got all this kind of going on uh, with the end of the Crusades uh, and all that. Uh, also, uh, I guess on the uh, positive side, if you want to put it this way, at least for, I guess, what happened in Europe, uh, they think that uh, a lot of the European states uh, became more powerful after the Crusades. Kingdom of France, Kingdom of England, uh, Holy Roman Empire, those states become more powerful after, like in England, uh, you know, uh, you got the Plantagenet dynasty uh, that you got that's that's real famous, uh, that's there. France has got the Capetian dynasty, and they have the Valois dynasty that they have that become powerful uh, in medieval Europe, uh, and so on. Uh, yeah, the papacy did not is not as powerful at the high Middle Ages. They're, they're kind of weakened because they had kind of influenced all these Crusades, you know, originally back then, uh, etc. Uh, they do think that the Crusades they think somehow sparked the Renaissance uh, because. Apparently, a lot of the uh, what happened with the with the Crusades was that the the Crusaders went to the Middle East. Uh, they came into contact with a lot of Middle Eastern trade goods that came from Asia, like spices and silk and things like that. And so the Italians later took advantage of that. They started sailing ships to like the Black Sea or whatever, and they they enriched themselves off the trade. Uh, and then all these rich merchants, like say at Florence and all that, used a lot of their wealth to create art and culture like be patrons of it or whatever. So that spawned the Renaissance later. So in a sense, the Crusades was one of the things that influenced, you know, uh, the Renaissance later, uh, et cetera. I think the Crusades influenced also modern exploration later because of Columbus and all that, because, because of Asian trade goods also as well. So indirectly anyway, uh, with that. So uh, that's my lecture today, of course, on, on course, uh, part two on the Middle Ages. Of course, uh, of course, tomorrow on Thursday, I'll have my last part three lecture, of course, which I'm going to talk about the later Middle Age. I'm going to talk about the uh, invasion of the Mongols, like the Mongol Empire uh, and their aftermath uh, that comes into Europe around the 13th century, roughly. Uh, then we've got the um, other famous things that happened, too. Of course, I'll get to the Renaissance. Of course, the main thing we'll talk about, of course, uh, is one of the major events of the late Middle Age you have. But I'll get into that, like the Black Death. Uh, which is something that kind of devastated Europe with the bubonic plague they have. Uh, I'll also talk about the Hundred Years' War. We'll get into that. That was kind of a major war uh, that was fought uh, in France, between France and England. So I'll talk about those topics tomorrow, uh, more or less.